What if Maul was trained as a Jedi? In the main storyline, Maul is taken by Sidious from the Knight Brother clan as a child, and he's raised to be a Sith assassin that would serve the grand plan of galactic Sith dominance. However, on one of our old videos, cartoon comic fan wondered what if instead Maul had been trained as a Jedi. That's what we'll be exploring today, so let's dive right in. Our story begins in the outer rim of the Star Wars galaxy, where a small group of Jedi was searching for four sensitive children to induct into their order. As they're looking, they all sense a unique presence in the Force on Dathomir, which they know is a dangerous world for light side users but they sense a deep potential in this child. So they decide to land on the surface. When they arrive, they are greeted by a suspicious contingent of Night Sisters who are not friendly to the Jedi, interrogating them as to their intentions on Dathomir. The Jedi raise their hands, telling the sisters that they come in peace and that they sense the birth of a powerful new child on this world that they wanted to meet. At this point, the group of Night Sisters brings the Jedi to Mother Talzin, who tells the sisters that this would be an excellent opportunity to build better relationships between their two orders. While the Jedi still do not approve of the Night Sisters' use of dark side magic, they believe that this child is worth the negative vibes of this planet. Talzin shows the Jedi contingent all of the baby Night Brothers and Night Sisters, and when they approach Maul, the Jedi can instantly sense the strong connection that this child has to the Force. They ask Talzin's permission to take this young boy, and Talzin gives them permission as she harbors no ill will to the Jedi Order at this time, and she only wants to learn more of the Force. The Jedi tell Talzin that they will give this young child a good life, and that he hopes that their two sects can collaborate further in the future. They then ask Mother Talzin what the child's name is, and she tells them that he had been called Maul, for he had a ferocious spirit. The Jedi nod, taking Maul, and they lead him aboard their ship, departing Dath. How does this impact the rest of the timeline? Let's take a look and see. In Maul's childhood years, he is raised to be a Jedi. For the first four years of his life, he is nursed and cared for by a rotating core of Jedi who are dedicated to the care of Jedi initiates that are taken before they're old enough to begin training. That's not canon, by the way, I just made it up to fit with the story. He is a bright, bubbly child who is curious about the ways of the galaxy, posing many questions to his Jedi caretakers. When Maul reaches four years of age, he is placed in the Bear Clan, and he begins his full Jedi training under the tutelage of Master Yoda, and he gets along well with his peers. However, as he grows older, he starts to become plagued by dreams of his old clan. He sees visions of Night Sisters blending into the shadows, along with hearing chants and incantations led by Mother Talzin. He sees the face of a black and yellow-skinned Dathomirian of the Night Brother clan, and he can't understand why. Being an incredibly open child, he tells Yoda about these visions after one of his classes, and the old master tells him that sometimes dreams can be deceiving. He knows where Maul came from, and he fears that if the child discovers his past, that he may begin to tap into some of the old dark side energy that Dathomir was known for. At this time, Yoda still fears the dark side, and he does not want to see one of his pupils struggling with more negative emotions. So, Maul does as he is told, and he ignores the dreams. Yet, somehow, Despite Maul clearing his mind in meditation sessions before bed every single night, he still experiences these dreams of a faraway place which he does not know to be his home. Maul shows incredible adeptness in lightsaber combat. When the time comes for him to go to Ilum and find his crystal, he ends up being led to a purple one, just like Mace Windu. Maul wonders why this rare color chose him, and he wonders if it has anything to do with his dreams. When he builds his saber, it ends up being a saber staff, just like his weapon in The Phantom Menace, and his peers are in awe. Dooku, who at the time of Maul's induction into the Order is still a Jedi, sees the prowess of the young Dathomirian, and he is incredibly impressed. He asks Yoda if he can pull the young Jedi aside and teach him some lessons personally, which Yoda approves. He ascends Dooku's recent frustrations with the Jedi Order, and he believes that perhaps another Padawan would allow Dooku to reconnect with his Jedi teachings. So, until Maul reaches the age of 12, Yoda permits Dooku to mentor Maul as a young Jedi. When it comes time for Jedi Masters to choose their Padawans, Maul is chosen by Dooku, as was expected by most of his peers, who tell him how lucky he is to be training alongside one of the most famous Jedi in the Order. Maul accepts this praise humbly, simply stating that he's a Jedi, like the rest of them, and that he has a lot to learn. When Dooku takes Maul aside individually after he chooses Maul, he tells him that being his Padawan is not going to be easy. 
He lets Maul know that he has a very different teaching philosophy from most of the other masters, and he will put Maul through rigorous tests to help him prepare for his Padawan trials. He tells Maul to meet him in the lightsaber combat room at 0600 in the morning, and to be ready for his training. Maul is eager to train with Dooku the next day, so he heads to bed early. However, he tosses and turns as his dreams of Dathomir intensify. The fog of the world surrounds him, and he can see the green spirits of past sisters in the mist chanting his name. He also still sees the face of the strange Dathomirian with yellow markings on his face. When he wakes up in the morning, he is exhausted, but he still stumbles out of bed for his training with Dooku. When he arrives, Dooku senses that something is off with the young Jedi. He asks Maul what is the matter, and remembering his advice from Yoda when he was a young one, Maul attempts to hide his dreams. Dooku senses that there is more to this though, and he inquires further, pushing Maul to tell him what was going on. Finally, Maul expresses his frustrations to his master, coming clean about the dreams that he had been having for years. Dooku listens intently, and he attempts to console his Padawan. Rather than tell Maul about his dreams and that they are deceiving, he lets him know that perhaps the Force is guiding him to something from his past or his future. He tells Maul that his homework, Dathomir, is known for having an aura of the dark side shrouding it, along with having witches and acolytes of the dark side that study there. Dooku says to Maul that maybe the Force is testing him, and that perhaps he needs to lean into these dreams rather than push them away. Maul feels relieved that his master didn't simply cast away his concerns, and he thanks him for listening. Following this, the pair end up practicing new dueling techniques, and Maul learns how to more effectively use his saber staff. For years following this, Maul and Dooku continue to do what masters and apprentices do. They go on many missions across the galaxy, helping those who are in need, or assisting with diplomatic crises that require mediators. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan go on many missions with Maul and Dooku, and Qui-Gon becomes a mentor figure to Maul, especially since he was also trained by Dooku in the past. As these events continue to transpire, Maul sees Dooku's continued descent into disagreement with the Jedi Council, especially after seeing how sometimes they were to serve the needs of the wealthy senators instead of the people suffering under their planet's corrupt governments. It's important to note here that in this timeline, the events of Dooku Jedi Lost don't take place as they do in the original. Dooku is busy training Maul, and as such, he is not sent to Sereno to deal with what is going on with his brother. Instead, he's meant to focus more on his Padawan, and as such, there is no prompting for him to leave the Jedi Order. So he remains, despite his disillusionment, committed to training Maul. Yet, there's still some tension in the air, and there will be an eventual turning point, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Dooku becomes more and more distant from Maul, and as the years progress, Qui-Gon tells Maul about the time that him and Dooku were once gone on a mission together on the unnamed planet from Tales of the Jedi, where Dooku had tapped into some of his darker emotions. Maul, out of concern for his master, wires about these feelings to Dooku. Dooku responds by telling Maul that he's starting to think that the Jedi don't truly represent the needy population of the galaxy anymore. Instead, they were working for a small, elite group that used their order for political gain. Maul contemplates this, telling his master that he still believes that the order is good, despite its flaws. Dooku merely brushes him off, telling him that perhaps he was right, but that he was starting to lose hope. As the events of the Phantom Menace play out, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are still sent to Naboo to deal with the blockade and to help remedy the diplomatic stress that seemed to be escalating on Naboo. Initially, Dooku asks to go along with them as well, but the Council refuses his request, stating that they can sense his recent negative emotions and that they think it would be better for him to stay at the temple and sort through his feelings while training his apprentice. This agitates Dooku even further, especially since he had gone on many missions with his former Padawan in the past which had been successful. Behind the scenes, Palpatine stokes Dooku's frustrations as Yoda had introduced them earlier in the timeline, telling him that he had requested Dooku to also go to Naboo as a trusted Jedi to help deal with the Trade Federation negotiations, given his reputation as an incredibly regal and astute Jedi Master. When Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan return to the temple with Anakin, Qui-Gon tells Dooku about the pod race and the boy's incredibly high midi-chlorian which Dooku is astounded by, 
He tells Qui-Gon that clearly there is something special about the boy, and he encourages Qui-Gon to push the council to allow him to train Anakin. Beyond that, Qui-Gon also tells Dooku about the encounter with the yellow-skinned, red-blade-wielding force user on Tatooine, which catches Dooku's attention. Dooku tells him about Maul's dreams, stating that clearly this couldn't be a coincidence. Together they go to inform the council of this interaction, and the council does what it always does. It tells them that they were wrong, and that the dark side couldn't possibly return outside of that small sect on Dathomir. Dooku reminds the council of his Padawan's origin, and they say that they will contemplate his perspective. Dooku leaves the council, enraged, frustrated that they wouldn't even consider his perspective. When he sees Maul again, he tells him that there would be no more training for today, and that it would be a day for both of them to sort out their feelings. Once again, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are sent to Naboo without Dooku, and they bid each other a kind farewell, hoping to see one another again when the entire situation had wrapped up. As we all know, that's not how it ends up going. Qui-Gon is still bested on Naboo by this mysterious new dark side user. Obi-Wan defeats him, and he graduates his trials, still becoming the knight that is ordained with training Anakin. When Dooku discovers the death of his apprentice, he reacts in the same way that he does during Tales of the Jedi. Except this time, he's still in the Order, and he's finally fed up with the fact that the Council couldn't handle listening to anyone with different philosophies on the Force and their place in the galaxy. He tells Maul of his plans to leave, and Maul is frustrated. Maul isn't yet finished his training. Dooku tells Maul that he knows that after years of their training together, he was certain Maul could pass the Padawan trials. Maul tells Dooku that he doesn't approve of his master's decision to leave the Order despite its flaws, but Dooku had been pushed beyond his limits. He leaves, and Maul is saddened by the departure of the man who had essentially been a father figure to him for years. Along with that, Qui-Gon was dead, and Qui-Gon had been his mentor for many years, much like an uncle. While Maul still had Obi-Wan, he felt lonely and a hole in his heart. Yoda comes to Maul after this, attempting to console him at the loss of his master, but Yoda's advice is the typical Jedi rhetoric that he had been hearing for his entire life. Dooku and Qui-Gon had showed Maul that there were other ways of perceiving the Force, and he tells Yoda that he's thankful for the help, but secretly, he admits to himself that it didn't help very much. Yaddle does a better job of consoling Maul when she passes him in the hallway quickly, especially after revealing that she had believed Qui-Gon from the beginning. Maul thanks her, and he says that he hopes he can see her again soon. She tells him that she's always open to chat, but she had some business to attend to before they could talk, and she quickly walks away. However, due to the events of Tales of the Jedi, we know that this is the last time any of the Jedi would see Yaddle, as she had died at the hands of Dooku himself, solidifying his descent to the dark side that Palpatine had been goading him on towards for years. For the next couple of years, Maul trains alongside Obi-Wan and Anakin, preparing himself for the Padawan trials. While he is of equivalent skill to Kenobi, his growth is stalled due to his sadness at the recent events on Naboo. He speaks frequently to Obi-Wan about how he enjoys training with him, and that he doesn't feel like there are any other Jedi in the Order who truly understand him. He recounts the issue of his dreams to Obi-Wan and how Dooku had been the only Jedi who had truly encouraged him to explore and dive into the cause behind them, which he still hadn't figured out. He also says that with Qui-Gon's death and the fact that Obi-Wan had battled the yellow-skinned Dathomirian, he believed that there had been something valid to his dreams. Sadly, the Jedi had told him to repress them. In a frustrated state, Maul tells Anakin that if he is ever having dreams of a similar nature, to tell someone and to act on them, not simply to repress them. Despite the Council offering Maul many new masters, Plo Koon included, Maul decides that he has had enough. He just wants to trade as a Ronin, finding his own way with his own set of values on the Force. Even though Plo Koon would have been a fantastic master for Maul, they respect his decision especially since he's still grieving. And so, Maul trains as a Ronin for the rest of his time as a Padawan. 
Hey folks, if you're enjoying this story, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications as we update this channel weekly with new What If content. Now, back to the story. After training like this for a few years, Maul passes the Padawan Trials, which is abnormal. The Council permits it though, given the unique circumstances behind Maul's background and his former mentors. As a Jedi Knight, Maul goes on many diplomatic missions for the Council, and he begins to see cracks forming between planets that would join the future Confederacy of Independent Systems and those in the core of the Republic. Dooku, who goes back to become the Count of Sereno, has prominent influence in the galaxy, and his voice is elevated. Maul hears him everywhere, and oddly enough, he actually agrees with much of what his old master has to say. Maul tells the Council this much, and he warns them about the growing sentiments within the Republic, and that there will be a significant amount of destruction that hits the galaxy, disrupting the peace that had held the Republic together since the days of the Nihil in the High Republic era. Ironically, the Jedi tell Maul that it is not their place to interfere in government policy, only to help those in need. Once again, Maul is annoyed, and he calls out the hypocrisy of their agenda, telling them that Qui-Gon had been more of a Jedi than any of them would ever be. This outburst gets Maul placed on probation for some time, barred from venturing out into the field. A few years later, the events of Attack of the Clones transpire. At this point, Maul is off of his probation, but he still has a bone to pick with the Jedi Council. He begins to see why his master left the Order, but he hopes that as a young knight, he can start to have some influence on the younger generation to help change things. He keeps in touch with Obi-Wan and Anakin, who are each on their respective missions to discover what's going on in the galaxy during Attack of the Clones, and he provides them with some insight that the Council might not have been able to give. Obi-Wan's journey goes relatively the same as how it did in the movie. However, as somebody who had acted as a mentor to Anakin when he had first joined the Order, Anakin trusted Maul more than he had ever trusted Obi-Wan, seeing him as more of a friend than a hard, by-the-books Jedi. Because of this, Anakin's journey changes significantly. Maul acts as the Qui-Gon figure in Anakin's life, and encourages Anakin to follow his dreams rather than repress them when he starts seeing his mother's suffering even if the Council didn't think that was correct. Anakin, who still had his rebellious streak in this timeline, tells Padme about this, and she agrees that they should see what's going on. Anakin arrives earlier on Tatooine than he does in Attack of the Clones, and he ends up saving his mother from the Tusken Raiders. Kleeg, Owen, and Baru promise that they will nurse her back to health, and that she should survive, all thanks to Anakin's actions. Anakin is relieved that his mother is alive, and he doesn't kill all of the men, women, and children too of the Tusken Raider clan. Because of Maul's encouragement, Anakin saves his mother, which minimizes Palpatine's influence over him in the future, and takes away one of the ways that Palpatine uses to manipulate the young Jedi. It is at this point that Anakin and Padme go to help save Obi-Wan on Geonosis, but they're captured. The arena fight goes essentially the same way that it does in the movie, and Mace's contingent of Jedi still come to save the trio. In our timeline, Maul is included in this attack force, when he sees his former master up in the press box of the Geonosian arena. He isn't shocked. He'd known that his master was a separatist, and he'd seen that he was a unifying figure in the movement. However, Maul is angry that Dooku was treating his old friends in such a way, and he makes himself heard. When all of the Jedi had been wrangled together in the middle of the arena, and Dooku gives them one last chance to surrender, Maul yells at Dooku, asking how he could just leave Obi-Wan and Anakin to die like this, and kill all of these other Jedi. It wasn't the Jedi way. Dooku responds that he is no longer a Jedi, and that sometimes, individual lives must be sacrificed for the greater good. Maul continues to scream at Dooku, telling him that there were non-violent ways of dealing with conflict and that he should continue to peacefully promote his ideas as an activist. Dooku shakes his head, stating that the Republic was far too corrupt and inefficient for peaceful political action to work. In that moment, Yoda and the clones come to rescue the remaining Jedi, and the Battle of Geonosis begins. Maul tags along with his longtime friends, Obi-Wan and Anakin, on the gunships that they take out of the arena, and he engages in the chase after Dooku. He starts to feel some negative emotions begin to boil, but he calms them as they fly after the Separatist leader. Padme still falls from the transport, and Maul watches as Anakin and Obi-Wan have a fight over what to do with Padme. 
Maul notes for later that this could be something that he would speak to Anakin about, but he decides that it is best to remain quiet during that moment. He knows that Anakin has a fiery temper, and he does his best to help quell it sometimes. However, on occasion, Anakin's temper flared over, and there was nothing that Maul could do. This was one of those instances. Finally, after what feels like forever, the trio of Jedi disembarks from the gunship and enters the hangar where Dooku tries to escape from. There, just as he's about to board his ship, is Dooku, who smiles when he sees his Jedi colleagues. He tells them that he had been looking forward to this and that they had to stop meeting like this, before throwing off his cape and igniting his curved blade, smiling. Maul, who hadn't been present when Dooku had given his speech to Obi-Wan about the Sith controlling the galaxy, is stunned to see that Dooku has a red blade, the traditional weapon of the Jedi's ancient enemies. However, Maul remains calm, igniting his purple saber staff in turn. Anakin still charges in recklessly, and he is quickly incapacitated by Dooku's lightning. However, Maul and Obi-Wan stand together, patient, ready to take on their former mentor. Finally, this was the time for a duel between former friends for the fate of the galaxy. Dooku goes for Obi-Wan first, attempting to take out who he perceived to be the weaker Jedi first. Maul, however, comes to the defense of his old friend, forcing Dooku to pivot his attention between the two Jedi rather than simply focus on one. Maul knows Dooku's tricks, as he had been trained by the former Jedi. Eventually, Dooku grows tired of Obi-Wan, and he starts to focus exclusively on his former Padawan. He shoots a volley of Force Lightning at Obi-Wan, putting him out of commission right next to Anakin. From here, Dooku taunts Maul, goading him towards giving back into his dark side emotions. Dooku tells Maul that now he has a new master, one who had a grand plan for the galaxy, and that Maul could fit into it so well. After all, he was Dathomirian. He was destined for darkness, whether he liked it or not. Maul fights back, telling Dooku that he would never give in to the same hate that Dooku had. As the two of them continue to dance with their sabers, Dooku then tells Maul that the Jedi had stolen him from his home and that they had robbed him of his destiny. He could have had so much more, living as one of the Knight Brothers, a group that was feared throughout the galaxy. Still, Maul refuses to entertain Dooku's words. After striking at Maul, which Maul blocks, Dooku asks him why he thinks that his lightsaber turned out purple. It was because of the darkness that he had within him, darkness that needed to be channeled in order to build a new galaxy, one that he could rule. Still, Maul does not break. Maul doesn't break until Dooku brings up Qui-Gon, that is. Dooku says that now he knew who had killed Qui-Gon, the yellow-skinned Dathomirian that he had seen in his dreams had been used as an agent of the Sith, and he had killed the esteemed Jedi. For a moment, Maul denies this, saying that if it were true, that surely the Jedi Council would have done something about it. Dooku laughs, saying that he had failed him as a master if he couldn't see the depths of the Jedi's hypocrisy. They refused to even acknowledge the possibility that someone could be threatening their power until it was too late. And that's how Qui-Gon died. While Maul knew of the Council's failings, he thought that surely they would have done something to protect one of their own members. Then, Dooku reveals the kicker. He learned that this Dathomirian assassin was Maul's brother. And this, Maul stops. His eyes go wide for a second, and he drops his guard. Dooku proceeds to shoot a blast of force lightning in Maul's direction, which he manages to come to his senses quickly enough to deflect. Perhaps Dooku was right. Maybe the way of the dark side was his destiny. But no, Maul was his own person. He didn't need to be held to some ridiculous standard just because of his heritage. Dooku had fallen, but Maul would not. Rather than give in to his dark side emotions, he unleashes a volley of force judgment at his former master, which is the light side version of force lightning. This wasn't something that Dooku had taught Maul. Instead, Maul had learned it as a ronin while fighting alongside Obi-Wan and Anakin. Dooku is knocked on his back, taken off guard. At this moment, Obi-Wan and Anakin recover and they follow Maul over to Dooku, hands on their sabers, prompting the Sith to surrender. Once again, Dooku tries to get Maul to give in to his hate and to just kill him there. However, Maul does not. 
Instead, he takes his master's old lightsaber, another fine addition to his collection, and tells him to rise. At this point, the contingent of clones that Padme had gotten to rally at the hangar also arrived, and they handcuffed Dooku. The Separatist laughs, saying that his imprisonment would only strengthen the movement that he had fought so hard to build. The clones don't care at all as they take Dooku into custody. Following Dooku's apprehension, the Separatists throw a fit. While Dooku was not a representative in their parliament, he was a visionary and an organizer of their movement. They view this as an unjust political imprisonment and demand his release immediately. Naturally, the Republic refuses, and the Separatists begin to launch attacks on crucial Republic worlds in order to try and pressure the Republic to free Dooku. This plays right into Palpatine's hands, who strengthens war measures and further consolidates power within the Senate. He assures Dooku that soon he will be released, and that if he doesn't blab to the Republic, then he will be securely broken out of jail in the future. Dooku, who trusts Palpatine's grand plan for whatever reason, decides that he will not tell the Republic anything. Instead, he continues to tease his old Jedi colleagues who come to visit, and he doesn't give any information to Republic intelligence officials. So this here's a little bit of an unscripted question, but do you guys think that if Dooku had been captured by the Republic, the Separatists would have gotten hashtag free Dooku trending on the holonet? Let me know in the comments down below. I'm legitimately curious. And if so, do you think it actually would have done anything? Probably not because it's a war, but it's a fun thought nonetheless. Anyway, back to the end of this video. I just thought that was a funny thought. Despite Maul, Anakin, and Obi-Wan being generals in the Clone Wars, and Anakin taking on the responsibility of having a Padawan in Ahsoka, Maul still finds time to pull Anakin aside and tell him that he should be cautious about allowing his feelings for Padme to consume him. While Maul had no romantic interests in this timeline, he completely understands that there are strong emotions that can bring good people to do despicable things, as he had seen in his master. He becomes a confidant for Anakin who doesn't feel as though he can trust most of the Jedi due to their rigorous adherence to their dogma. Maul becomes an alternative figure for Palpatine to Anakin, except he doesn't try to manipulate Anakin. But because Anakin feels as though he has someone he can turn to within the Order, he isn't as receptive to Palpatine's attempts to secure his loyalty. Anakin continues his relationship with Padme behind closed doors. How do these things impact the end of our story? Let's find out. Palpatine continues to wage the Clone Wars throughout the galaxy. The galaxy suffers, and the political elite profits. Maul expresses his reservations about this war to the Jedi Council, along with the fact that he feels uncomfortable about using what are essentially child soldiers to fight, and they continue to assure him that the Chancellor knows what's best for the Republic. Maul is very wary, telling the Jedi that he doesn't believe that they should be fighting a war like this. Eventually. The Council tells Maul that they have a special assignment for him. Reports of a new threat rising in the outer rim of the galaxy continue to run rampant, and he was assigned to investigate these rumors, given his proximity to the threat. When Maul inquires further, wondering how he could be close to this threat, the Council tells him that it appears that the old Sith assassin who had killed Qui-Gon was resurfacing, and that he was running a small yet vicious criminal empire. Maul's stomach drops. His brother had returned. He tells the council that he will be taking Master Kenobi to help deal with this threat, who agrees to go with him. Soon, Maul would come face to face with his past, and because of that, the true challenge to his loyalty would soon come to be. Hello there, Star Wars friends. I hope that you enjoyed this what-if scenario. If you did, please think about watching this other video. What if Sidious trained Mother Talzin? Have a lovely rest of your day, everyone. And as always, I hope that you've had your daily dose of Bantha Stew.